Good morning, everyone, and welcome. This webinar is brought to you by Strategies 2.0, a statewide collaborative funded by the California Ch Office of Child Abuse Prevention. Today's webinar is LGBTQ plus inclusivity. The webinar is scheduled from 10 until 1130. My name is Carrie Collins, and I will be your facilitator today. My role today is to introduce the topic and the presenter, keep track of time, and help the presenter and all of you participants in any way that I can. So in a moment, I will introduce the presenter to you. But first, I'd like to go over a few of the webinar guidelines. So as participants, you have a little tool, uh, tool control panel, and you can open and shut that panel as you desire. Let me see if I can get that going. Just by pushing that little red arrow, it will open and shut your control panel. You can join us today either by the telephone or by your microphone and speakers. We have found that sometimes the telephone gives you a better sound than microphone and speakers do, but that totally depends upon your computer. We're going to use the chat box quite a bit today, so if you have any questions um, that you have for Alejandra, please enter those questions into the chat box. My colleague, Lydia Marquez, will be monitoring the chat box today. And so either she will ask those questions for you, or if you want to raise your hand, we can actually unmute you, and then you could ask the question yourself. I have muted all of you, so you don't need to worry about your background noise. If you mute yourself also, and then you want to ask a question, you will have to unmute yourself before we would be able to do that. We will have some polling questions that will happen uh, during the, uh, the process of this some, uh, webinar today. And this is a way for you to participate in what's happening. And I, I will walk you through that when it's time for our polling questions. Um, if you look in the materials section of your taskbar, you will see that there are two handouts that have already been uploaded. The PowerPoint presentation will be given to you within a couple of days uh, of this presentation this morning. So all of you will receive the PowerPoint, and we will also resend you uh, the two handouts that are in the presentation. Um, I see that Alejandra is getting back on. That's a good thing. I will probably, hold on, I'm going to send her a webcam request. Okay. Um, there she is. In just a moment, I will introduce uh, her to you. Um, <clears throat> today's presentation is by Alejandra Enciso Medina. She has been a community advocate for the LGBTQ plus community for over 20 years. She has worked with low-income families, youth and children in multiple capacities, such as a court-appointed supervised monitor, a family advocate for Head Start, and currently a reproductive health educator for youth and parents. Through her community advocacy, Alejandra developed partnerships with LBGTQ plus organizations such as House of Pride Equality, or HOPE, and Gay Rights Advocates for Arts, Culture, and Equality, GRACE. These are family-oriented organizations that support LGBTQ plus children, youth, adults, and parents in North Santa Barbara County. We feel very, very honored and privileged to have Alejandra as our presenter today, and I just know that we are really going to enjoy this presentation. I am going to make her the presenter at this time, and she will take it from here. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to welcome everybody to LGBTQ Inclusivity. Like Carrie said, my name is Alejandra Enchisa Medina, um, and I am happy to be here with you guys. So we'll get started right away. Um, like Carrie said, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, so the objective today is to um, find out why families are important, um, what is LGBTQ, um, 
what are some key terms, preferred pronouns, um, and everybody will get a chance to do their gender unicorn, which is an activity that you can do on your own. We'll analyze our own personal values and then bar uh, barriers to be inclusive with families, as well as a messaging and inclusivity around your facility or space that um, you can look at to improve. Um, and so there'll be a couple tips for that. So first, um, I wanted to brainstorm is um, why are families important? And Carrie, um, this is where our poll was at. So if you can pull up the poll. Right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send out a poll question to you. Why are families important? We have some answers for you to choose from. But if you have a different answer than what we have given you, please put your answer into the chat box for us. So you should see this. Why are families important? The poll is now open. We invite you to go ahead and check whichever one you think, or if you have a different answer, please put it into our chat box. We only have 38% of you that have voted. We're gonna keep giving you some more time. Very good. So I'm going to close these polls <clears throat> in about five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And then I'm going to show the results. So can you see that, Alejandra? Let's see. Most people said uh, all of the above, 92%. Um, four percent said they raise the next generation, and four percent said they provide uh, our support system. Let's see, do we have some answers in the chat box? I don't see any answers in the chat box. I'm going to go ahead and hide that, and back to you. Perfect. So, um, as you guys said, as you guys know, um, families are very important because they are the foundation for building or raising a new person in our community. And obviously, families, um, multiple families build a community. So, um, as times change, we know that family dynamics are different. The structure of families are different. So, that's um, what we're going to be tackling today. Um, that no matter how different families are, they're all valuable as individuals, but also as um, groups of people. So what is LGBTQ plus? Um, LGBTQ is an acronym um, to describe folks uh, in an expansive way, um, representing gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, just be aware that sometimes you'll see LGBT, LGBTQ+, plus, or LGBTQA+. Plus. Um, there's different ways that, um, that people describe it, or sometimes they just do LGBT um, or LG, LGT. Um, so it's just a different, they all mean the same thing. And then as you can see, this was um, uh, a picture of the White House when uh, gay marriage was conducted uh, was approved to be by the Supreme Court universal for all folks. So um, I just wanted to give that little bit. So here are some key terms that we will tackle before going into the knit and grit of LGBTQ. So this is like the basis of, of what you need to understand before we go into the other component. Sex assigned at birth is your biological, physical, um, um, your inner organs, your chromosomes, your outer organs, your outer appearance. That is what your sex assigned at birth. So basically, if you have um, a vagina, then you're you're a female. If you have a penis, then you're considered to be a male, right? Um, sometimes people are born with both or a variation of some. And this is folks that we call intersex. And it's very common, actually, one out of, 
one out of every 1,500 births are people who are born with um, both either a variation of chromosomes or variation of autonomy. Um, these, like we said, we, these people we call intersex. Um, gender is your perceived um, idea, what culture thinks of you. So for example, if I look, uh, I have long hair and I wear makeup, so people perceive me to be female. Uh, or feminine. If I were to have short hair and I were to have um, dress more quote unquote masculine, then people would perceive me as male or masculine. Gender identity is your personal interpretation of how you feel. So gender identity can vary in some folks or it could be just um, on a scale, right? Um, so, for example, um, there are some days that you just want to be more relaxed and you want to wear more of um, sweats and things like that. So then you would be more, quote unquote, masculine, right? But um, your gender identity would always be what you feel you are. So people, folks that are perceive themselves to be the same as their sex sign at birth, then they're called cisgender. Gender expression is how you actually choose to identify yourself by clothing, makeup, um, jewelry, accessories, things like that. This is what um, expresses the inner gender identity. And then sexual orientation is actually who you are attracted to. So the romantic, the feelings, the physical, uh, the emotional attraction, that's really what um, what drives sexual orientation. And then lastly, allies or advocates um, are people who are really there to embrace the LGBTQ community and really fight for their rights and make sure that they have the things that you that they need to um, thrive in, in our communities. Is there any questions so far? I'll wait a couple of seconds. Oh, <laughs> Looks I like think we have a type of questions. Type of, yeah. Um, so there's one question. Yeah. Christina Hollowell has a question for you, Alejandra, um, uh -huh. <clears throat> regarding sex assigned at birth. I thought that when doctors tell parents what sex the baby is, they usually only look at the external and anatomy. Internal anatomy is usually only discovered, considered later, and many people never learn what their chromosomes are. Yes, um, that's usually what happens. And so um, previous pa practices were that if a child was born intersex, they would just, um, they would just choose a gender for the child. And then later on could potentially face problems such as like massive bleeding because um, the perceived boy or male, it was actually female with the uh, internal organs of a, of a female. So, or for example, their penis was inside their body and it wasn't until puberty that their penis ascended. And so things like that happen. It's actually very common for um, the penis and the testes to be built in, uh, to not develop, um, so much so when puberty happens that testosterone happens um the actual penis descends and so do the testicles great question any other questions there's a a comment for you that many intersex people are assigned an inaccurate sex at birth from christina hollowell yes that's correct what that's Part of the reason why they're pushing to have a, in California a gender X, which would hopefully help um, intersex babies or children or young people that are both with both genitalia to be more um, accurately diagnosed or actually actually labeled. Any other questions? I think that's all for now. Okay. So the next thing we're going to go over the sexual orientation chart, um, and this is a big one. So a lesbian is a female that is attracted to a female, right? 
Um, and we're talking about physical and um, emotional in the sense that you want to marry, right? Or you want to be with this person emotionally, passionately. Um, a gay is a, a male who is attracted to another male or a person who is attracted to their same sex. For example, females can be called, female uh, lesbians can be also labeled as gay. Bisexual are people who are attracted to both genders, both male and female. Um, people who are questioning are people who are not sure of their sexual orientation, meaning that they're still exploring, they're still not sure if they're attracted to one or the other. Um, this is just a, for some people, this is a point of getting to the final destination of whether they decide to be gay or lesbian or um, bisexual or pansexual. Um, they're going through this process. Queer is somebody who doesn't like um, the label of um, LGBTQ, uh, of LGBTQ, so they would actually stop label them as queer. Um, and so one thing to note about queer people or queer folks is that unless you're really part of the community, um, that term is kind of like more for the LGBTQ community or if you're an advocate um, or an ally. Uh, you wouldn't want to say it um, just like randomly. Um, the term queer was uh, previously used as a derogatory term, and now we're trying, uh, the community is trying to take it back and uh, we're tr they're trying to empower themselves. So as allies, we empower by saying, oh, you know, my friends are queer, da -da -da, and so on and so forth. Asexual is actually very common amongst women um, because uh, we, as women, are very focused in our careers and we find that um, relationships are not necessarily a priority or being with somebody. And this is not to say that um, people who are asexual are not sexually active or do not have relationships. This is just that they do not um, prioritize relationships or, um, or uh, romantic relationships as part of their um, daily routine, right? Or their goals. Um, it's actually very common in women who are in high paying positions or like CEOs or very high management positions. And then um, the last two is plus, which is heterosexual or straight, so people who like the opposite gender, and pansexual. Pansexual means that you like all people of all gender identities or self-identifying uh, identities or sexual orientations. So this would be this is regardless of the person's gender or, or sexual orientation. Okay, next we'll go into gender identity uh, chart. This gender identity chart is, um, first we'll go with transgender. So people who feel that, identify that they're, they're not the person that they, they um, were assigned at first. So sex side at first. So for example, if I was born as a male and I choose to dress female, then I would be considered transgender. Gender expansive are people who um, can switch from, gen from gender identity from one day to the next, so, or from one month to the next. Um, so they're, they're close to like, sometimes they feel more feminine, sometimes they feel more masculine, and this is um, how they express their, their gender. They're more of, of a fluid, from one to another. Non-binary uh, folks are people who dress like right in the middle. So if you think of somebody that um, you can't tell if they're both male or female, this would be a person who's non-binary. So they just don't want to be identified with either gender. Um, and then gender queer or gender non-conforming are folks that don't exactly want to be labeled as one gender or another. Um, they prefer just to be uh, in a like um, like self-identifying, like not necessarily one or the other. And then gender cis are folks who always identify with their sex assigned at birth and have never questioned um, their um, their gender or don't struggle or don't have the uh, don't ha understand either. Uh, why they would be confused about their gender. They just feel empowered by their gender and that's what they are. So um, for example, I'm a, a cis uh, female 
and a heterosexual cis female, for example. Does that make sense? Any questions? Because I know these two concepts are kind of intense. <laughs> So we'll pause for just a moment to give you a chance to put any of your questions into the chat box and then Lydia will ask those for you. If you want to ask um, Alejandro the question yourself, just raise your hand, do a little hand raising thing uh, next to your name and then we can unmute you and allow you to do that. Not seeing any questions at this point, Alejandra. Okay, perfect. So I'll keep going. Um, so as you can see on the bottom, there's a scale. So sometimes we feel more like a Barbie, right? Or a very, very extreme form of feminism. And then one in the middle where we see um, like somebody who's non-binary and then on the other extreme would be somebody like GI Joe, right? Or somebody who's always identified as male. These are pictures of gender expansive folks or LGBTQ expansive folks. For example, James Charles, he's relatively new for some folks. If you're a millennial, you probably know him. He is the first male to appear on Cover Girl magazine. And he started very young to do makeup tutorials on YouTube. And that's how he was able to um, uh, reach fame. And then the next two folks that you see are Liliana and Logan. Uh, Liliana is a vet of the U.S. Air Force, um, U.S. Army, and she served as a nurse. She was first a male and transitioned into a uh, a female. And then Logan is actually um, his sex assigned at birth was female and he transitioned to full male. So uh, they were actually recognized um, by their work of um, tra uh, male transgender folks in the military by Obama in, um, in his last year of office. So they were one of the first um, couples that really went um, for um, supporting this cause. And then Ricky Martin is a gay man who is a father of two. And then um, for all those people who really like um, telenovelas and Mexican movies and stuff like that, Cristian Chavez is a singer and an actor, and he is um, a big star in, in Mexican um, media. And then Wanda Sykes is wonderful. And if you know Wanda, she's lovely and I love her as a comedian. She's great. So this is um, really one of the first, um, this component, the um, pronouns or preferred pronouns is one of the hardest concepts to get when you're um, talking about LGBTQ folks or trying to address them. The reason why is because we're learning to um, speak a lot. Uh, we've we've learned to speak English in a prop in a certain way, and so this we have to retrain our our brain to not necessarily what we see is what we have to say. For example, if we see a male who's more who's transgender and is in transition and is looking to be more female or feminine, we would say she, her, hers, right? Um, so if I was in the transition phase, then I would ask people to say she instead of he, even though my name would probably be, um, Alex, right? Instead of Alejandra. If, um, people are more masculine or want to be referred in a masculine sense, then they would say he, him, her, his. And so you would say he is in a transition phase, for example gender neutral or gender non-binary and this is where it gets complicated so somebody who is gender queer gender non-binary gender non-conforming we would address them as they them theirs so we're and we're only talking about one person so we would be saying it in a plural um this is where sometimes we um and i even still have trouble with it and some of my friends um that are in the lgbtq community 
really struggle with this because we have to really um, retrain our, our brains to say they or them when it's one person. Um, if you want to be more grammatically correct, you can use the last two. And these are for also for gender neutral folks, which is then, their, them, theirs, that, or the, here, here. And these are just uh, more um, grammatically correct, but they would actually ask you to use those terms. Um, so whenever you're asking somebody, what would they prefer to be uh, called or addressed as, we would ask them, hey, what is your preferred pronoun? And I would say she, her, hers, or him, his, theirs, or they, them, theirs, um, depending on what they decide. Um, and then you would try to address them that way throughout the conversation. If you do make a mistake, you want to apologize the first time and then just continue your conversation as, as so. Um, so um, this would be a continuum. And I think I just saw a question and it says, what is a preferred pronoun? So a preferred pronoun is the way that people prefer to be addressed as. For example, I prefer to be addressed as she, her, hers. And in Spanish, I would say ella, right? Um, because that's my um, gender identity. If I were to be more masculine and identify as a male, I would be, pref my preferred pronouns would be him, his, him, his, and his, right? He, him, his. Does that make sense? I hope that made sense. Any other questions about preferred pronouns before I keep continue with this? Carrie? Um, let's give everybody a moment if you have any questions about this. Now is a good time to ask. Do you want me to read this question, Carrie? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, Gwendolyn Garcia says, I'm sorry if I missed it, but when a person is transitioning, is it better to ask what pronoun they prefer? Yes, um, if a person is transitioning, you would say, um, hi, what's your preferred pronoun? Um, usually what we're in the um, reproductive health community, what we try to do is we try to go around when we introduce folks um, at the beginning of any meeting and we ask, what's your name, your agency that you're working for, and your preferred pronoun. And that way we establish that right at the get-go and, and then you can just, um, you can just move on from there. Any other questions? I've seen, um, this is Carrie. Hi, everybody. I've actually seen where people have written like on their name tags or whatever. Uh, and even people are starting now to put it on their business cards. So things okay. like that really help those of us that are still on that continuum to learn all of this. That's really helpful. Yes. Um, so a lot of folks are, it's, it's really training your brain to address people as they prefer to be addressed as and not what we with we see or we perceive someone to be. Um, and like I said, this is probably one of the hardest parts of understanding LGBTQ um, verbiage and the realm of LGBTQ because people can transition from one, one area to another. Let's say in their teen years, they want to be known as non-binary or non-conforming. But then in their college years, they identify as one gender or another gender, and then therefore um, they would transition and then um, they would say, okay, now I, I feel I am a man or now I feel like I am a woman, where previously they would be wanting to be called they, them, theirs. So if you get this part wrong or if you, you, you're, you, and I want to just, uh, really stress this that this part is really hard to get um, to understand not necessarily to understand but to change your verbiage to uh, be welcoming more to preferred pronouns um, but if you do get it wrong like I said one apology is great and then really try to continue on this uh, learning path of uh, acceptance and inclusivity um, 
don't beat yourself up for it. Um, we're all we're all human. We all make mistakes, but we just want to make sure that we're really trying to be inclusive by honoring people's um, self identifications. And I believe we have a polling question right here, just to see how familiar they are. Were we doing it here or after the unicorn? Uh, yes. Here is the question. So let me turn it back. There you go. We can pull the poll. So what we're asking you is how familiar are you with the LGBTQ plus pronouns? So either select very familiar, some familiarity, or limited knowledge. And go ahead and put in your answer. We've got almost half of you now. We'll close the polling in 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the polling and share the results. So we have 32% are very familiar, 54% have some familiarity, and 14% have limited knowledge. So we're leaning towards understanding this a little bit better. That's great. Yay. This is always the hardest part for, for everybody on, on this learning path. Okay, so next thing, if you did print your gender um, unicorn, you can definitely take it out right now and self-color and self-identify. Um, this is a great activity for um, parents who or folks who um, are trying to understand what gender or what gender identity some uh, what sexual orientation or gender identity somebody identifies as, or a youth or a young child or even an adult. Um, so gender identity, like I said, you would be female, feminine, um, a girl or masculine, male or boy. And then other is that you identify as like non-binary as we talked about before. So these are the different identities, right? Sexual expression is if you choose to be more feminine, right? More masculine, um, or you choose to be in between. And then sex assigned at birth is either male, female, or, um, uh, or uh, intersex. One thing to know that gender identity, um, so I have friends who are single moms and they say, well, I play both the ma the mother and the father figure, right? So how would I identify? And I tell them, well, you're a little bit of both. So you can identify as a little bit of female or halfway female, halfway male, or more female and a little bit of male because you're doing um, dual dual roles in your in the way that you carry out your your life. So um, this is where not necessarily you're saying, oh, I'm a man, but you're embracing a part of yourself where you're teaching um, others of the generation that comes after you how to be more um, of a man or quote unquote, right? And then, or more of a female, quote unquote. Okay. Physical attraction is what you're attracted to. So for example, uh, we know that a guy in right now is Chang Tatum and when we hear the word Chang Tatum we're like Ugh, right so if you're attracted to men um that would be your your physical attraction um and then also if you're attracted to females that would be your your who you're attracted and then some people are attracted to both right or other genders and then emotional attraction is not necessarily um, somebody you want to get married with. Um, it could be anybody, your best friend. You just know that there's always going to be that certain connection that you can't explain. Um, or, you know, la comadre or compadre, um, you know, your best friend or your, your neighbor or um, your mom and your dad, right? These are folks that not necessarily you want to get married to, but you're attracted to them because they, they fulfill a part of your life that emotionally that you need, right? Um, it could, but for the most part, almost everyone puts both or everybody um, because love is, can be universal. And we're talking about like emotional love. We're not talking about like love as in um, marital or um, a, 
like in a physicalness. Any questions? Let's see. There's a question here from Gwendolyn Garcia. Yes. Do you have suggestions on how to approach these questions on demographic surveys? What is the most culturally appropriate? Great question. Um, Gwendolyn. So when uh, when I work with youth, I do, um, for example, uh, for gender, I put uh, male, female, uh, gender non-binary, and then other or uh, so that are trans, right? You wouldn't ask sexual orientation because that would be um, inappropriate. So you would just identify the gender of the person. And that's usually what um, any census or any state or federal forms would request. Any other questions? Hey, no other questions. Yay. Okay, so uh, values. This is a really cool activity and I like to do it in person, but um, this is uh, something that um, we will not be able to do today. And sorry, let me get you back to this. Okay, oops. Oh. Okay. Oops, that is way too small. I'm sorry. Okay, so this, if you have a chance to do this with some of your colleagues or even a, as a self activity, this is a great activity to see where you stand. So, for example, do you feel that same sex couples should have the same ac e equal access to marriage? Do you agree, strongly disagree? Um, do you uh, strongly disagree or strongly agree, right? Um, and then you would circle each of your responses as you go through the different questions. And then you would try to answer the op. If you're doing this at, at, by yourself, you would try to answer the opposite of why somebody would, would choose the opposite. And the reason why is you want to make sure that you, you're looking at all perspectives, not just your own. And so Hopefully it challenges you to see other folks and we're, we're trying to make sure that we, we're all inclusive, but this is more like to get folks who are not on this um, um, uh, ally in a space of being an ally or an advocate to think about why it would be uh, important. And the reason, um, and the way I would define agree versus strongly, disagree, strongly agree would be that people feel that um, LGBTQ um, rights are human rights. So for example, um, he, all humans have the right to be married regardless of their sexual orientation versus I agree, well, you know, I think that they should be able to get married strongly. So disagree, well, it doesn't affect me, so I don't have to worry about it. Strongly disagree would be somebody who's like, well, I don't think it's ethically right or morally right or somebody would, coming from a religious perspective, right? And then we have the second question would be, uh, should religion play an important role on how someone makes their decisions about gender identity? Remember, gender identity is not necessarily sexual orientation. So then to make that distinction would be very important. Now, um, for three, this is where it really comes down to um, most people would be basing their response for, on a religious basis. Uh, religion should play an important role on how someone makes their decisions about their sexual activity, meaning the actual acts of uh, like cuddling from kissing, snuggling um, to even uh, sexual partners. And then number four, all sexual orientations, heterosexual, bisexual, gay, lesbian plus, our natural expressions of sexual diversity. Do you agree, disagree? Um, it is okay for transgender folks to dress as the sex or, uh, as the gender they identify. For example, if I were to identify as male, it is okay for me to come in the workplace dressed as a male or go to an event as a male. Um, is it okay for children to dress in clothing that does not reflect their sexual, their sex assigned at birth? 
Um, and for people who work with small children, like in a Head Start side or, or a different, um, or child care providers or things like that, this is always a good question to, to really take a look at where you are at. Um, what I would say is that, you know, um, if you have a, a dramatic play area for children, obviously they're going to dress as whatever there is available. And usually um, most people are comfortable with girls dressing in mas more masculine um, clothing. And but when it comes to boys or males dressing in more feminine, that's where people start getting, oh, well, maybe this is not a good idea. So really analyzing how you feel about that will really help to see where you are on the scale of, um, of ally and advocate for LGBTQ rights. Should couples have the same rights to raise a family? Um, for example, I said Ricky Martin, he has two girls, right? And I think they're twins to be exact. So should, um, should LGBTQ folks be raising children? And some people are very uncomfortable with this. Um, and some people are very like, yes. Um, and so I would say that all, par all people have a right to raise children if I'm strongly agreeing. And then I'm, if I would be more of a homophobic or I wouldn't be more understanding, I would say no, they can, people can identify, uh, these children would get a wrong sense of identity or, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so really looking at that component. And I always tell folks that, you know, families are built very differently. Sometimes we have grandparents raising children for example, I'm a co-parent, I, I raised my niece. So um, in that sense, I'm a single mom, but I'm not. So families are just very different, right? Um, and if you work in a, in a center or somewhere where we, oh, actually, sorry, this is number eight. Um, so by California state law, um, teachers are not allowed to disclose um, the child's gender identity or sexual orientation. So if a child or a youth um, discloses at school that they are um, gay or if they're non-binary um, or queer, then um, teachers and teaching staff and administration are not allowed to tell parents. But some parents were like, well, what about if I'm very supportive? So this was um, a law that was enacted in order to provide a safety net for youth in order and children so that um, you know when this was not as acceptable as it is today um, youth or children would suffer from you know domestic violence and so they um, in turn California um, decided to provide the safety net for children so that um, they when they disclosed it was their choice not um, the choice of an, another adult or they were being pressured to come out of the closet. Um, number nine, I don't advocate for LGBTQ people, families, children, because they're, it's not, um, it's their issue, not mine. It doesn't affect me. So this is where you would lie, we, where you would be, where you lie on um, the scale of advocacy. And for example, if you are for immigrant rights, right? So are you a for, why, why is that pushing you in that direction? Or if you're not, why is that pushing you in that direction? And then lastly, I don't agree with LGBTQ uh, way of life. So this is really like a judgment on um, how folks, LGBTQ folks are and um, really analyzing that. Is there any questions? So Alejandra, this is Carrie. So when you do this activity in your in your training with folks, how how does this go? Um, you're going to have a lot of different thoughts and feelings and values around this. So how do you manage uh, the feelings that will come up? So what I do is um, I've done this a couple of times and it's re it's really worked out really well. Um, I actually put a strongly disagree sign, a strongly agree a uh, uh, strongly agree sign, a, a disagree sign, and agree sign. And I have folks uh, answer their questions anonymously and then crumple up their paper. And then I give it to other folks. So that way um, other folks can answer in their place. So that way if you 
if you're on the like not more progressive or um, inclusive side, you might get a paper that is very inclusive and then it makes you think or analyze and you would respond as that other person. So you wouldn't necessarily respond as your your own response. You would respond to the, the question as it is on your paper. Does that so you get a feeling then from the room where where people stand, but it's anonymous. It's not necessarily their answer. Have you had some really good discussion that has come out as a result of this activity? Actually, I have. Um, there was uh, I did this with about fifty people <laughs> the first time, and it was really um, I was really shocked because um, I knew some of the folks that were in that in that group and. I knew some of them were a little bit more conservative than um, than more uh, inclusive, and so when I got a feel for the room, I was like, "Wow, this is uh, I'm I'm happy that more people are being more inclusive." And the people that weren't as inclusive actually ended up getting um, results that were very uh, inclusive, and so um, they actually had to think like pe people who are very embracing of the LGBTQ community. Thank if you. There, if there is struggle with this activity, um, I always remember uh, tell people to look back at the question and leave it as it is in the, on the paper and not necessarily take this a personal attack on their, their views. They're just answering as the what is reflected on their paper as well. So that really helps a lot of people just kind of like focus back in and not go on like a tangent. <laughs> Any other questions about this activity? So here's your chance to ask Alejandra any questions that you might have regarding this activity. And this is in your uh, materials. I'm not seeing any questions. Okay, great. Um, so this quote was, um, I don't remember where I heard it. I think I heard it from Carrie, but a little bit different. And I just kind of like fixed it a little bit. And it says the absence of complete inclusivity anywhere is a threat to complete service at anywhere, everywhere. So basically what that means is that um, if we're not being inclusive to all folks, right, we're not serving everybody equally. So it's really important to be inclusive regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, uh, religious background. Um, and as, um, I think that we all work in the public service field and so um, human services. So I think you all have a grasp of this concept. So some of the barriers to um, to really um, provide um, diversity and be effective and inclusive is a sense of entitlement or privilege. We go back to like, well, I identify as a, a female and I'm married to a man, so this doesn't bother me. I have other things to do. I don't really have to um, provide um, any extra support. They got this. They 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 can handle it on their own. So that sense of entitlement that it doesn't, um, that their issues are not your issues is really um, a way, um, it puts a barrier to be more inclusive. Resisting to change. So some people are just like, well, um, I get it, I understand it, but it's just hard um, to use preferred pronouns, so I'm not going to do it, right? You just, you just don't want to do it. Uh, systemic oppression, and we all know of systemic oppression, whether it be a glass ceiling, um, whether it be, uh, you know, uh, systems that we put in place to make sure that we oppress people. For example, um, not just recently, the, um, the National Head Start Association passed a law where all their um, forms needed to be inclusive, meaning that instead of saying 
mother and father on their forms when they were registering children into the program. All the forms had to say parent one or guardian one, parent two or guardian two. That way that if people identified as a, a difference or there were two moms or there were two dads in, in the household, they were able to um, include, be feel more inclusive. That's just a small example of systemic oppression, but it can get to a larger. And then there's um, the last part of um, barriers is just an, an, an unawareness of the need to adapt, meaning that, oh, well, you know, we changed the forms. I think that I'm inclusive, but you don't go beyond like, oh, um, for example, you will not put a safe space poster on your on your desk or on your wall or on your window, right? You just, eh, it's, they're, they're okay. Does that make sense? <laughs> I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so some of the things to understand, and this is where we can go into tips and information. Um, so messaging is very important when we're talking about being inclusive. So subconscious me messaging is something that we don't do with our conscious mind. For example, wearing jewelry or clothing or makeup, um, the shoes we wear or um, anything like that, that d tells people well, our situation. And, but not necessarily when we're, to, when we're receiving unconscious messaging, for example, if we see somebody with a wedding bed, um, the most appropriate question would be, oh, what's your partner's name? Or um, would you like to invite your partner instead of saying, oh, do you wanna invite your husband or your wife, right? You want to be more inclusive and use terms like that. And overt messaging is language used openly. For example, um, oh, your partner, instead of saying, oh, your husband or your wife. And when I was a case manager, if anybody of you out there are case managers, you had to deal with um, families. And this was uh, is very common, I know. When I say, oh, um, they would tell me their partner's name and it was a male and it, I was dealing with a female and I was like, oh, your husband. And they're like, no, it's my boyfriend. And their face totally changed and I was like, oops, you know? So <laughs> this was a great example of like overt messaging, my own subconscious just saying things without really being inclusive. So for, for once I did that a couple of times, I was like, oh, okay, now I need to say my your partner or what's your partner's name or, you know, and then they they self disclose. Oh, it's my husband or it's my boyfriend. So that's much better way to to send some messaging than to just um, um, than to just say, oh, your husband or your your boyfriend. Uh, messaging is important because it really tells you what people believe, and it really is a way of like being inclusive. So um, for example, um, if you display art in your in your office, it really tells a lot about you. Or if you have family photos or things like that, it tells a lot about who you are, what you're like. And then if you see if you do, for example, home visiting, you can see by looking around their home what their interests and what their life is really like. So these are some tips to uh, supportive messaging, whether they be verbal, and then we'll go into some visuals um, as well. So verbal is, um, like I asked, um, when unsure, ask a question such as, what is your partner's name? What is your preferred pronoun? Um, use the word parent instead of um, mom and dad. And then ask if it's if you know the the couple is LGBTQ, then ask um, what is a child or what do you prefer to be called as mommy or um, mom or um, mommy and mother or dad and daddy or dad and papi. Um, I have um, uh, friends that are co-parenting, and one of them is dad, and the other one is papi. So. Um, this is a great example of like um, children or they self-identify as their role in the family dynamic. Um, do you talk about different types of families with um, with uh, other folks? 
that are LGBTQ, like um, families can be grandma and grandpa or aunt and uncle and, you know, nephews, or they can be um, one mom or one dad. So the addressing that all families are important, right? Um, if you hear name calling or if you hear um, that, you know, messaging that can be, or behavior or messaging that can be harmful, really addressing that at a very, um, as soon as it happens, really does help to be more inclusive and bring in more folks and feel more comfortable. And then personally invite um, parents uh, of diverse representation into either if you have meetings or if you have, um, you know, family get togethers or whatever activities you guys are planning in your day to day in your like monthly meetings or whatever, um, make that extra step to personally invite them. Visual messaging. So if you are um, sending out messages, uh, are your forms um, are your forms inclusive? Like I said, um, parent one, guardian one, and parent two, guardian two. Display safe space posters. Um, dear, use language like dear families uh, or to all families. We like to welcome you. Blah 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 or um, we welcome everyone if you're working with just um, singular folks instead of a, a, a group dynamic. Um, what is a safe space poster? Oh, I got a question. So safe space poster, um, I had one at the beginning of my slideshow and it's usually um, a, a rainbow flag and the most current includes brown and black because um, we are including people of color that are LGBTQ folks and or, or usually there's a you can just google safe space poster and then most a lot of posters will have like a triangle or a, a rainbow flag and it'll say safe space and that just means that if an LGBTQ person comes into your office or your location that they are welcomed and that they will not be judged. Let me see, I, I see the blinking. Is there any other questions? Um, I think that was it. Was there any other questions? I would. <laughs> I don't see <laughs> any other ones so far. Great. Oh, let me go back. So, um, so display, and then um, there's actually some in Spanish too. So if you wanted to Google safe space poster Spanish, you can find some great um, artwork that really reflects that, that um, safe space poster. Um, do the pictures or the artwork in your office or your facility display um, inclusivity? For example, do they, um, do they display African American families, Latino families, Asian families? Do they um, do they display um, different um, types of backgrounds or sexual orientations, things like that? Um, so it's very important to not only just be inclusive with the LGBTQ family with the LGBTQ folks, but also with other um, cultural ethnicities, right? Um, does your curriculum, if you're using a curriculum, is it a, is the wording in the curriculum um, inclusive? So for example, um, when I teach reproductive health, I tell you, uh, um, instead of saying females and males or women and men, I say people with vaginas, people with penises, but it might not be appropriate for your, for your space. So you can say, um, are all, um, all folks or all people or all students or m use terms that are more inclusive in that way. And do your stories or things represent diversity? Um, do you, figurines, like if you have a dramatic player um, or toys in your facility, do they represent diverse families like grandparents and aunts and like other multicultural folks? And then um, when you do role play, 
make sure that there's a diversity in that. And then that your books reflect um, diversity, right? Like um, stories in Spanish maybe, or stories in um, Japanese if you're working with Asian folks or um, with folks from different other cultures. So other supportive messaging, um, does your music reflect um, diversity? If you your facility plays music, does your environment um, create an environment where children and families can come together or youth feel included? Uh, and I know depending on the age group is very different. So for example, if I had, um, if I were to be working with um, zero to five year olds, I would have you know, like a, a dollhouse versus if I'm working with teens, I would have more of like artwork that would represent diversity. And versus if I'm working with adults, I would have other artwork that would be more specific to them, right? So just making sure that um, we, everything's age appropriate, but also diverse is very important. And then be aware that you might get, um, you might have to answer difficult questions for children or adults or other members in the in your that you're servicing. So for example, children are famous for saying, oh, why why does that, why does so-and-so have um, two mommies? Um, and then my answer would probably be, well, their family is different. You have a mommy and daddy, but other folks have uh, mommies and uh, grandma and grandpa, or tita and tito, or um, they have um, two mommies or two daddies. And so that really is very important um, to addressing those questions. And just be prepared that you might have to be the one addressing that. And then be prepared to address uncomfortable uh, discomfort topics with other parents so, or other folks. Other folks might say to you, well, um, I think that they're not as in, they're, that family is different. And then you would address like, well, what do you mean by different things like that? And I think we have another polling question here, Carrie. Um, yes, we do. This is our last polling question. So what we want to know is how is your agency doing with supportive messaging? So select one that we are on the right track, we still have some work to do, or we just got started. So go ahead and answer that question. We have about half of you that have answered so far. Keep this open for a little bit longer. So we have about three quarters. So I will close the polling in about 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. I will close it and share the results. So we have 21% that are on the right track, 62% that we still have some work to do, and 17% that we just got started. We didn't even give you the option that you haven't done anything yet because we figure everybody's trying to do something. So there's the results. Yay, good job you guys. I'm glad that um, some of you are, even if you're just starting, there's there's little things you can do, little changes that really can support um, LGBTQ folks in your space. So thank you for that. Oh, sorry. Um, lastly, inclusivity, inclusivity is understanding that in all individuals have a choice to their openness to other families, meaning that um, people who are LGBTQ, it's their choice when they come out, not or how how much they will disclose about their own personal lives or their own uh, families to other families or other people. It's not up to us to disclose for them. Um, they they need to feel comfortable when they're when they go um, when they are gonna disclose. Um, La, uh, second is that we should always make, go the extra mile to invite these folks to whether it be parent meetings, regular meetings, or any activities that you're having at your your site. 
um, to really help bring in that diversity into, into your space. And lastly, remember, um, we are all people and it, and it is time to break down discrimination and to really create a healthy, um, healthy communities, meaning that um, we see so much of, of hate and uh, uh, animosity and dislike in our, not only in the social media, but in politics and all this other stuff that it's really important that uh, we unite as communities to be stronger because maybe I'm good at, um, bringing resources to folks, but I'm not good at networking with folks to get them the resources. And somebody who is LGBTQ, who has multiple resources of people that need those services. So by partnering, we can build healthier communities. Any questions? So we have plenty of time for any questions or comments that you might have. If you could just put those into the chat box for us and then Lydia will manage that for us. <clears throat> I think it's really important that we start this conversation. I was very, very pleased that the Office of Child Abuse Prevention thought that this was an important topic for us to cover. Um, we do a cultural proficiency training within strategies and oftentimes we bring up difficult topics to talk about and that's that's the beginning you know if it's if you're a little bit uncomfortable that's good that means that there's things to think about and things to talk about and that it's okay to ask questions and it's even okay if those questions come out a little messy every once in a while um that's how we learn and, and how we grow so i'm not seeing any questions for you at this point lydia do you see any questions that i'm not seeing I'm not seeing anything, but I'm just um, encouraging everyone if they have questions or comments about Alejandra's presentation today, feel free to enter that in the chat box and I'd be happy. Oh, look, we have someone now. Stephanie mm -hmm. Larson um, says, if asking questions to individuals of the LGBTQI community regarding their experience of coming out or how much personal information they feel they have to explain or reveal to others who ask or who don't. I apologize for my ignorance on this experience or issue. However, I wonder if they feel insulted to even have to explain their experience. Have you ever had individuals express this or do they prefer to have the opportunity to explain their experience? I actually haven't had that. That's a very great question. I actually never had the, um, the, I've asked folks and um, usually we build friendships before you get to that place, right? You want to build a certain amount of confidence and, and trust with folks. Um, and usually when I ask, um, oh, so how is it when you came out or things like that? Um, they're very open to saying that, but just remember that um, for some folks, it might be traumatic experience when they came out. So you want to be, um, be aware that um, you want to have a space where if you're going to ask that question, you know, tissues might be nice, a little hot tea or something like that. Um, but um, you wouldn't want to ask them with a bunch of other folks unless that conversation came up naturally. There is um, a, a couple of other comments and questions. Kathleen Ramos said, great job, Alejandra. Great we webinar. Thank you. So thank you, Kathleen. Um, Jennifer Kuo says, collecting data for reports, um, i.e. state doesn't necessarily all of the breakdown. So I'm not sure if you want to expand on that a little bit more, Jennifer. Maybe. Um, Maybe she's just speaking to how when you collect data for the state, um, it doesn't give you all the options for gender yeah. identity, if that's something that comes up. So, for example, at our agency, we're doing CAP60, the um, Community Block Grant, which is the CSPG, and some folks might be familiar with that. So, um, they don't require everything. So, what we did in our CAP60 form in order to... Um, to be more inclusive, we put male, female, and other because they don't necessarily need transgender or um, they don't need non-binary or they don't need um, 
queer questioning, right? They just need one of the three. So if you don't necessarily need all of the questions, you can just stick to male, female, and other. Great. Any other questions? I'm going to go ahead and give this back to myself, but that does not mean that you cannot um, ask the questions that you want to ask while I'm doing this. Um, I just want to remind you that we are Strategies 2.0. We really thank you for being on the webinar today. I hope that it was really helpful for you. An evaluation will get sent to you automatically. We really appreciate when you fill out these applications. It helps us for uh, our future webinars. Um, within a few days, you will be receiving the PowerPoint presentation along with the two handouts that were in your materials section, just in case you had a hard time uploading that. Uh, we invite you to go to our website, www.strategyca.org, to see uh, what trainings we have coming up in your area, what webinars we may have coming up. You can go in and hear the recordings on past webinars. Um, you can request trainings from us, so all kinds of good information. So before I sign off, I just want to once again thank Alejandra for a really excellent webinar with great information. Um, just one more last chance. If you have any questions or comments, I'll wait just for a moment to see if anything comes up. We have a thank you. Um, <laughs> and if not, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank, Thank you, Alejandra. You. Thank you, everyone.